Welcome to Langlands Library. Um, we have a very special guest tonight. This is Ranger Alan Banks, and I'm going to let him do the talking. He's going to tell us all about the Frederick Law Olmstead legacy. That's a nice round of applause. Well, thank you, Alec. I, I was telling someone that I think I came out of Boston at about 4 o'clock this afternoon coming out with one, and it was nice to find this on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, actually, it's, it's funny because some of the same things that Olmsted was dealing with, you know, 100 years ago or so, uh, you still have those issues today in terms of the stress of living in the city, and hopefully this uh, will kind of tell you a little bit about Olmsted. Um, but I, I, I would be remiss in not explaining why a National Park Service ranger is in the middle of, well, basically, it's nice uh, outside of suburban Boston. I think most people, when they see somebody dressed like myself, this is usually what they think of. They mm -hmm. usually think of uh, great national parks mm -hmm. out west and when we were established. Anybody know actually how many years ago we were established? Uh, I'm here at Harrison Channel. When we were established back then, most of our mission was really kind of geared towards these large national parks. Uh, most of them set aside because of the scenery, of course, the Grand Canyon. And I have to tell you that because Homestead did not. <laughs> um, and uh, Yosemite, of course, on the right, and Yellowstone, which was actually the very first national park established in 1872 on the left. So there were actually national parks before there was a National Park Service. Uh, originally, it was actually the Army who protected these lands, and that's why our uniforms were somewhat military. Uh, they were even more so in the old days, like when Gerald Ford was a, a park ranger. They would be like that. <laughs> um, but again, people, when they think of the National Park Service, and I know when I dress like this, they expect me to be a, an expert. Uh, in Massachusetts, there are some national parks that are a little bit more traditional, like the Cape Cod National Seashore, which of course protects a natural resource. But uh, as the Park Service kind of matured during the early part of the 20th century, especially during the 1930s under the Roosevelt administration, we started getting much more involved with protecting cultural resources. And if you're into the Civil War and ever traveled down south, uh, almost every major battlefield is administered by the National Park Service, part of the Department of the Interior. Uh, anybody recognize this National Park? Longfellow. Yeah, Longfellow. Very really good. Oh, All right. Yeah, over on Brattle Street in Cambridge. It's actually one of our sister parks. Uh, my park, Frederick Longstead National Historic Site, uh, is administered by the same superintendent. At, uh, she also administers Longfellow and John F. Kennedy birthplace. If you know where that is in Brooklyn, where President Kennedy was born. So this is where I work. This is Frederick Law Olmsted National Historic Site. Uh, it's in Brookline. And if you're familiar at all with Brookline, if you were coming inbound from 128 on Route 9, exactly five miles from when you got off of 128, if you look to the right, you're going to see the Brookline Reservoir. Mm -hmm. It's the only body of water you'll see, so you'll know that's it. If you were to take a right right after the reservoir, that's Warren Street. And if you go up about a quarter of a mile uh, at the corner of 99, at the corner of Warren and Dudley Street is 99 Warren Street, which is where I work. So, of course, it's called Frederick Law Olmsted National Historic Site because of this gentleman, Frederick Law Olmsted. Um, I know people have a, a very wide variety of knowledge of Olmsted. I think most people, of course, know him as a park designer. And we don't like to believe it up here in the Boston area. They usually think of that park down in New York City. Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, Central Park, of course. Um, but uh, he's really considered the founder of the profession of American landscape architecture. And as you'll find out, uh, hopefully, talk a little bit about the other types of designs that he was involved with. Uh, but where I work is where he moved to from New York, actually a mid-career, set up his practice in Brookline. Uh, he had two sons who he trained, become landscape architects, and he retired, which they did. On the right, uh, John Charles Olmsted, Charlie. And in the middle there, on the left, is Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., who they called Rick. So when we talk about Olmsteads where I work, we're really talking in terms of a, a plural because not only do you have Olmsted Senior, the famous one, Central Park and Prospect Park in Brooklyn and the Capitol Grounds, Biltmore, but you also have his sons who worked on places like Forest Hills, Queens, uh, Audubon Park in uh, New Orleans, uh, some extremely, I could give you a whole laundry list. Uh, Palos Verdes, if you're familiar with that area out in California, or suburban development. And actually one of my favorite places I was just at not that long ago down in Florida called Block Gardens. If you're in, in Central Florida near Lake Wales, it's a, a beautiful park that uh, his son designed. So we estimate that during the time that Olmsted, his sons, and even later associates were running the firm, they were involved in about 6,000 landscape commissions in 46 of the 50 states. Uh, about 150 in Massachusetts, uh, 1,200 projects, I mean 150 cities and towns, uh, about 1,200 projects. 
you unfortunately are, are one of the 201 towns who do not have an Olmstead project. Um, but they did do work, and we're gonna, I actually chose a couple of projects that you'll recognize that are pretty local to this area. So these are actually photographs uh, of the firm in Brookline during their heyday, which is really the 1920s. And that does surprise people, because when people come there, they figure after Olmstead Senior retires, that's the end. But in some ways, it was just the beginning. And although his sons were not as famous as their dad, they were actually more prolific. So of those 6,000 landscape commissions, about 80% were done during the time that his sons were running the firm. And because they were so prolific, they amassed a huge amount of records. Yeah. Uh, when the Cayman National Park Service site, it was actually two separate purchases. One was for the site itself, a two-acre estate in suburban Brookline. And the other purchase was for a collection of 144,000 plans and drawings, about 66,000 photographs there on the right store in those draws, all the materials that went into creating all these landscapes. So when this became a national park, not only did people tour the site, but one of our major roles today is a research center. We service about 1,500 research requests from people all over the world who come to access the information that we have on these landscapes if they want to restore it, or even if they just want to understand it. What was the design intent back in you know, 1910 when the Olmstead brothers were designing this park in Fall River? Uh, so we, uh, again, service researchers, we're doing more digitally now, so you can actually go on to Flickr, if those of you are familiar with that particular uh, uh, website, it's uh, all pictures, and we have about 66,000 photographs up there, along with about 20,000 plants. And you'll see some of them. But you can tour. Uh, actually, we're open, this is our high season, we're open Wednesday through Sunday. Uh, and we have tours all during the day. And you get to travel through all the different design studios. That's actually an electric blueprint machine that you're seeing there in the back. That tube is for making copies. But, uh, I came here really to talk to you a little about <coughs> Olmsted and of course his work in Massachusetts. But I think since Olmsted was an artist, like any artist, you can't really understand his work until you understand his life. Uh, and even more so with Olmsted, because almost all he learned was through experience. Uh, I'll tell you right now, he never really went past high school in terms of education. He never attended college. But uh, again, he was somebody who eventually found himself and where his story begins is where everybody's story begins, where they were born. In this case, uh, Hartford, Connecticut, on April 26, 1822. Um, not a rags to riches story. The Olmsted family was very well established when Olmsted was born. His father was a well-known merchant. Um, and actually, this is a picture of his dad and his dog, Neptune. Mm -hmm. um, the Olmsted were dog people, by the way, if you're into dogs. They love dogs, too. Uh, um, but this is his father. And uh, the reason I have him up here is in his early life, he was certainly the most influential person. Uh, his mother died of a drug overdose when he was three, so he didn't really know her. His father remarried, and, and I think there was, a, you know, there was tension with the blended family. He eventually had half brothers and half sisters. But his father uh, took great care uh, with Fred. And the description I like of his father is not by Olmsted, but actually by Olmsted's wife. She described him as the most kind and indulgent of fathers, a man with a clear sense of duty and justice acting to himself rather than to others. And it's that word duty that is what I draw from that quote because what we're going to see is Olmsted's dad pretty much would bankroll any uh, kind of idea Olmsted had in terms of finding a career, traveling, um, but he said no matter what you do, it should be something that's going to benefit people. There should be some type of a benefit. Again, the sense of duty was very important to his father. He instilled that early on in Olmsted. Another thing he instilled in him was a love of scenery. Olmsted said some of his happiest recollections were the travels that his family used to take. He said they weren't vacations, but rather they were tours in search of the picturesque. And so his father liked nothing better than to travel throughout New England. They, who, who knows, they could have passed through here. And just seek out beautiful scenery and, and, and kind of let it have its effect. Mm -hmm. Anybody recognize it? Come on. The Gorge? Yeah, Queechee Gorge. Oh, yeah. Oh. Oh. If, if you don't like heights and you see the sign of Beachy Gorge, you better just keep on going. Trust me. This is really Vertigo City when you look over that bridge. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the idea in Olmsted's mind is not only, what, again, this, the scenery beautiful, but he said even as a young boy, he started to understand the power that scenery had on people's emotions. And different types of scenery had different effects on people. Uh, in fact, he became very enamored of uh, reading about English landscapes of the 18th century uh, that were designed by people like Humphrey Repton and Capability Brown that worked in this romantic style, which is very informal, and I, and I mention that because it's going to 
inform his later park design. So here's Olmsted as a young man in his 20s. Uh, he tried to be a clerk in New York, hated that. <coughs> Uh, sailed to China for a year on a merchant ship, hated that and was sick while hating it. Uh, got to China and spent about a half a day there. Um, came back, uh, tried different things, tried to be, actually he studied up in North Andover for, as, to be a surveyor. Um, liked it, but it wasn't going to be his career. Uh, eventually what he does is he convinces his father to buy him a farm. And the idea is that he's going to become not a farmer that's going to make a lot of money, but a, a, what they call a gentleman farmer or a scientific farmer. And this is actually a drawing of his farm on Staten Island, actually. Um, and in Olmsted's mind, his job on Staten Island was to experiment with different types of things like fruit trees and grafting fruit trees together, new types of drainage that were being introduced. And again, that sense of duty. That idea that what he learns on his farm, he's going to share with other farmers. And back then, almost everybody was a farmer or supply farmers. So he's reasonably successful. Again, now it's you know 1850. Uh, he's 28. Not, not you know not old, but he's certainly no kid anymore. And he finds out about a trip that his brother John and his friend Charlie are taking to England and to Europe. And he writes his father that it basically it's killing him to know that they're going and he's not and that he could take care of them, and he's a better traveler, and blah, blah, blah. And I guess Dad, at this point, kind of had it. He said, listen, I bought you a farm. <laughs> You're staying on the farm. <laughs> You're not going to Europe with Charlie and uh, John. <coughs> Orange, of course, is not going to take no for an answer. So his comeback is, you know, Dad, the farming techniques in England are so much more advanced than the are. <laughs> <laughs> so off he goes and travels on the continent, but more importantly, travels throughout mm -hmm. England, which he had read about during his time growing up as a boy. This is a picture of Blenheim. Uh, which is probably best known where Winston Churchill was born. Uh, and I, sh I have the image up here because it kind of illustrates a little bit of that English romantic style. Uh, one of the maxims, for example, of English landscape gardening with nature of is a straight line. The nature does not produce right angles, therefore these landscapes always have curving roads, trees planted in an irregular way, as opposed to something like Versailles, which is obviously very geometric and uh, kind of shows the power of the person who created it. In Olmsted's mind later on, what he would say it was the art to conceal art. He didn't want you to know that somebody actually designed this particular space. So he, he, again, he travels, sees the countryside, but also is visiting England in 1850 when it's really right in the middle of its industrial revolution. He gets to see some of these urban areas, which in some ways are reflecting what's going to happen in this country. Visit places, in this case, Liverpool. And when he visits Liverpool, he's told of this place called Birkenhead Park that he <coughs> It was considered today, it's still considered to be really the very first public park in the country. So Olmsted, of course, wants to visit it, which he does. Again, that English romantic style, I mean, curvy roads, everything kind of scattered around. And Olmsted thought the design was nice, um, but what impressed him more was the fact that it was open to the public. Everybody from all walks of life was there. And he actually would write in his journal uh, that there was nothing in America comparable to this people's garden. So you figure, okay, he's seen scenery as a kid growing up, read about landscapes, seen a park, he's going to come back and become a park maker. Now he's going to make one more detour. The deal with his dad, this was training, and as part of that deal, he had to keep a journal. And from that journal, he created a book, which he got published called Walks and Talks to the American Farmer in England. Reasonably popular, but gets him involved with the publishing world. And in 1852, when the New York Times is looking for a correspondent to travel through the southern slave states, they hire Olmsted. The idea being that he's going to take uh, journeys as far west as Texas. He's going to write an unbiased, and I put that word in quotes, uh, look at slavery, but more on the economic side. Um, you know, in 1852, the moral question of slavery, in some ways, the book form had already been addressed uh, by the Palms Cabin. In Olmsted's mind, his job was to just reflect what is down there. And, I, and of course, he did think that when it was you know, seen that they find out that slavery couldn't exist economically. So Olmsted travels uh, for a, over a course of about two years, two separate journeys. Actually, his brother goes with him to Texas because his brother was very ill with ter tuberculosis. And from these journeys in newspaper articles, he writes a series of books. And this is how I first knew Olmsted. My background is not in landscape architecture. It's certainly not in the natural sciences. Uh, it's uh, in history. I'm a history teacher by training. And I knew Olmsted through uh, studying the antebellum South. Extremely popular books, you know, in the 1850s, right before the Civil War, anything about the South was going to be kind of popular. 
and Olmsted is becoming more well known as an author. But the problem is he's in the midst of editing the last of his books, A Journey in the Backcountry. It's 1857. He's 35 years old, but still has no idea what he's going to do once his book's over. With, you know, does any books in the work? So what happens is serendipity steps in. Uh, he's at a Connecticut Inn, and he's having breakfast, and a guy comes up to him and says, uh, you know, Mr. Olmsted, they're looking for a superintendent for this new park down in New York. You've done some farming, you have some good social connections. You're a Republican, but not too much of a Republican. <laughs> uh, and so Olmsted actually writes to his brother and says, I'm going to apply for the position of superintendent for this project because what else can I do for a living? Mm -hmm. So at the age of 35, he applies for and actually obtains it through social connections. Um, one of the people who writes a letter of recommendation for Olmsted is Washington Irving, mm -hmm. who in 1857 in New York is a good guy to say that you're a good guy. Mm -hmm. uh, so his first uh, relationship to Central Park was not as a designer, but as the superintendent who was executing a design that already existed. What happens is a short time after Olmsted gets involved with it, an English architect along with some other people, and actually his name is Calvert Box, convinces the city that they'll regret executing the plan they have. It's horrible. And it is, if you've ever seen it. So they say he convinced them to hold a contest for a new design, and he thinks Olmsted would be a great guy to partner with. He's already working on the landscape. Uh, and if they win, they'd actually get to execute their own design, which is kind of unusual. Usually you design it and somebody else builds it. Oop. I shouldn't have skipped like that. I think there's an animation in there, some that I can't get out. So anyways, their plan uh, was to change 800 acres of land in midtown Manhattan and to create an urban oasis for a city that really doesn't exist yet. Central Park built wise really doesn't leave the 20s. Uh, Central Park doesn't begin until 59th Street. That's one of the amazing things about this project, almost more than the construction, which was incredibly amazing how much they had to do to it, was the fact that the city was willing to expend all this money on something it didn't really need quite yet. So, Olmsted and Box, of course, they win that contest, and they are <coughs> instantly overnight sex. Um, now, if you look at New York City in 1857, it was, you know, obviously a tale of two cities. If you were a Vanderbilt, things weren't so bad. You know, you had food, uh, doctor's care, I guess back then could swing both ways. Um, but when the epidemics, like this time of year, when people got sick from things like typhoid and cholera, summertime was the worst time to be in the city, you could pack up your bags and go to Newport or up to the White Mountains. Um, that pretty much left behind almost everybody else uh, who were living in neighborhoods like Five Points. And yes, that is Leonardo DiCaprio, if you're curious. Uh, anybody here see the Gangs of New York? Yes. Yeah. 1857, same year Olmsted's in Central Park. And it gives you a sense of how nasty things were back then. No sewage system, you know, fresh water if you're lucky. Of course, you bring all these people, I mean, they were having population densities of like, a, you know, a quarter of a million people per square mile, where today New York is about 30,000 with high rises. So of course, you bring all these people together with no sanitation, what do you get next? Yeah, you get things like cholera that would wipe out, you know, practically half the neighborhood. And if you're if you have good eyesight, what you're seeing here is cholera that's supposed to be Europe in the background, New York City in the foreground, and kind of right up above that it says science on that guy's belt. So what it's saying is he has cholera coming from Europe, and what are we doing here? We're doing nothing. We're sleeping. So when you talk about an Olmsted Park design, one of the immediate things it was going to address was the physical health of people living in cities. The early proponents for a lot of these parks were doctors because they were trying to understand there was a correlation between green space <coughs> and physical health. For example, they found that people who worked outside for a living tended not to get rickets so much. Because if you're familiar with rickets, it's from a lack of vitamin D. Uh, and even today, Central Park's air quality is a little bit better than it is in surrounding Manhattan. And once the park was built, actually, doctors would prescribe for their patients every you know two hours a day for the next two weeks. You just wander around Central Park for what ails you. Like I said, I came up Route 1 today. <laughs> uh, so I understand Homestead said that although people physically were coming together, they were moving away spiritually from each other. I mean, if you think about it, when you're in traffic, you're not thinking the greatest of thoughts about the people around you. You're trying to gauge their weaknesses, and or, are they going to let me in or not? Are they going to try to cut me off? Here, this guy's coming. So there was... Uh, even back then, they were starting to understand that people were starting to have uh, difficulty with urban living and the pace of urban living. So when Olmsted was designing his parks, it really was also, besides the physical, it was the psychological effect. 
Holmes had said, the chief end of a large park is an effect on the human organism, which like that of music goes back to thought, cannot be fully given the form of words. So like this is a sequence that was called the ramble. As you're traveling through these curvy roads, of course, even this landscape curving, scenes are opening and closing in front of you like music. So each scene has a different pitch, but with Olmsted, he strung them together in a way to create a sequence that created a melody that would unconsciously, hopefully, be stretching. And then the kind of the third component was the idea of community, what Olmsted called communitiveness. Um, Olmsted's mind, a park was a place, again, like Birkenhead Park, where people of all walks of life could come together. In fact, he said, uh, 12 years after he designed the park, he said, where else in the year of our Lord, 1870, we let see vast numbers of people brought together. Each person added the pleasure of all others just by their mere presence. And he talked about who we saw there, young and old, rich and poor, Jew and Gentile. Uh, actually, Box, I think, put it better. He said, uh, call, describe Central Park as democratic ideals and trees and dirt. <laughs> so again, it was a piece of art, but it was a piece of art to provide a real social purpose. And that would always guide Olmsted's designs. It did not just parks, but anything he was designing. What was the purpose of the design? It wasn't aesthetics were second. He said service must precede art. There can be no beauty without utility. Or form follows function. Mm -hmm. So Olmsted, besides being a park designer, would eventually go on to design other types of landscapes. I guess people think you can design a park, you can design the capital. Mm -hmm. um, and actually the biggest thing that Olmsted did was on the west side design this terrace. And so he would design architectural features, mm -hmm. not a, a huge one. These are actually watercolors in our collection that you see on the bottom there. You can imagine if without this terrace, Olmsted even described it. He said it looks like the whole building's ready to slide down the hill. <laughs> so just by doing that, especially after the Civil War, you know, we just want, you know, this, this is a stable government. And the design itself, unlike a park where all architecture was subservient to nature and, 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 and the organic things around it, of course, he knew that people weren't coming to the capital to look at uh, the landscape, so everything was designed to show off the building as best as possible. I mentioned that uh, Olmsted was also involved in, in, indirectly with the establishment of the National Park Service. Uh, during the Civil War, he traveled out to Yosemite Valley. He was actually a mining superintendent. He still took a break after Central Park, and actually, it wasn't until he came back east in 1865 that he really settled down, but in 1863 and 1864, he traveled out to California and was introduced to Yosemite Valley. And that pamphlet you see there uh, is actually one of the very first times you see somebody with a really cogent, complete argument of why government is obliged to set aside these areas for all people, and they should never be owned privately. Uh, and the Olmsteads would actually work all across the National Park Service. Uh, anybody here been to the park who brought up in Acadia? Um, yes. Well, that was his obvious son. Mm -hmm. um, you can go to the Everglades. That Olmsted Jr. was also instrumental in helping that set aside. In fact, Olmsted's son was the guy who wrote the legislation that established my job. <laughs> so I always Olmsted's things on so many levels. Um, and again, those are that's kind of our mission statement, what they call the Organic Act of 1960. Um, last project before we go into Massachusetts is Riverside. Olmsted was a huge proponent of suburbia. He said, "Great towns, by towns and many cities." did not long exist without great suburbs. And he felt that the future would lie in a world where people worked downtown, they went to cultural events, all those kind of things were there, but they would then travel out to these suburban places, these very verdant environments where they could have some solace after the day is done. And again, the curvy roads. Uh, this is, Riverside is actually, I didn't even say where it is, it's about nine miles from downtown Chicago. So it's a very flat, very flat design. But they tried to make it as interesting as possible. There was a river going through it, which you kind of guess with a name like Riverside. Um, but the idea was not only for people to have their own piece of land, but look at how much green space there is in this. I mean, it's, it's, it seems to me that you take it for granted that there's going to be a park somewhere, but the fact that they were willing to give up all that land to you know, develop for green space was pretty amazing. So again, uh, the overall town was designed by him, Fox which included all these little pocket parks, I call them. They're not huge, they're like maybe a quarter acre, but they're always very close to every single house. And uh, what I'm assuming here, and I'll believe to the my, end of my life, that they're trying to help those ducks get back into the river, not trying to cook them or anything like that. Uh, but it sounds trite though, but if Olmsted did not design these little parks into this design, into this uh, project, then this, 
little scene would never have happened. And if this little scene never happened, when, this, when these people see each other in three weeks at the supermarket, they're not going to say hi to each other. They never even met each other. Here they had a place to interact with each other and, and again, promote that sense of community. So again, in Olmsted's mind, it was the same thing as a park, just again on a much smaller scale. But he also felt that people needed to have their own piece of land. He said that it be reflected that the enjoyment of home scenery can be pursued without abandoning other pursuits. It strengthens family ties and feeds the roots of patriotism. Again, the social component. One of the things that's interesting I find in this design was what he wrote in terms of the covenant for it, the rules. And one of the rules was that every person who owned a house had to plant two trees in front of them. Mm -hmm. Now you think, oh, that makes sense. We still love trees, you know, shape and nature. You want it to be lush. Yeah. But the reason he said that, he said, you can never trust people's taste in architecture. <laughs> <laughs> so Olmsted himself uh, li is, moves out of New York, actually. And I'm just going to sit for a second. This is a bad leg. And uh, moves to Brookline. This is actually a picture of him in his uh, plant room, which he added. Uh, you can see that what's called pebble dash stucco in the background with a uh, plant or something growing out there. So again, even when you're inside, Olmsted felt you should be outside or at least have nature close at hand. And this is the project, of course, most people around here know him through, which is the Emerald Necklace of the Boston Park System. So just there's the Boston Common, the Public Garden, that dark line is Calm Ave, uh, the Back Bay Fen, so that's basically where uh, Family Park would be right there. And then the Muddy River, Brookline's up here, Jamaica Pond, the Arboretum, Franklin Park. How many here have been to at least one portion of the Emerald Necklace? I would say, yeah. I mean, I'm sure almost all of you have been to the Boston Common. It wasn't an Olmsted design, but he understood that he was linking the downtown area of Boston with the newly forming suburbs. You can see how important he felt this was. I think partially because he, he knew he would never see it. He was designing something that would take 20 or 30 years. And when you're in your 60s and the 1880s, uh, you're pretty sure that this isn't something that you're going to be able to experience. But I guess that's the true definition of altruism. So, to look at the Emerald Necklace design is much different than looking at Central Park. Central Park was a big rectangle uh, that just was shoved in the middle of the city and they, they blasted out rock and they planted a thousand decrees. The Emerald Necklace is really based more on water and water quality and water flow. And this is a, a map of Boston, 1777, so there's the Boston Common. And some of you may know that if you started walking west from the Boston Common in 1777, when this map was made, twice a day you'd fall into muck and twice a day you'd fall into water. Mm -hmm. Because the Back Bay was a tidal area that would go up and down, you know, uh, by uh, daily for, uh, uh, again, as a very, a very dynamic and a very clean environment, relatively speaking, at least natural, in its natural form. But of course, you can't leave things alone you've got to have more land. So what you do is you start cutting down the hills that made up that little peninsula, and you start putting fill around the dock areas that create wharves. But you also start to fill west. You start to see that big back bay is just being empty space. So this is a picture from the State House. There's Calm Ave on the right. You know, the trees are obviously very small. And, it does, and actually the back bay doesn't look like it goes much beyond Fairfield. Frida, I can't tell them in the background there. And you can see they're just they're basically building on this thing as they're mm -hmm. filling it. Build, 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 build. So that eventually, of course, you do end up with your back bay. Oh, I forgot this image here. This is actually pretty good. It shows you kind of how much of Boston is made land. So the original yeah. you know, peninsula is, is less than the size of Franklin mm -hmm. Park even. So lots of made land. And of course, mm -hmm. the most famous of the made land is, is the back bay neighborhood. As you may know, some of these buildings are on stilts, yeah. wooden stilts. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's one of the reasons of uh, why they built the dam in 1910, to try to keep that water level at a, at a particular level. But Olmsted's design for the Back Bay Fens was really to <coughs> solve problems of uh, flooding and of pollution. Because when they filled in the Back Bay and they created that neighborhood, the bay still wanted to be a bay. The water was still flowing in there. You were still getting the water coming up from the ocean tidally twice a day. You still had the Charles River flowing into that area. You still had Muddy River, which is an estuary of Charles, and Stony Brook. So you still had all these places uh, trying to handle this water, and it couldn't. It started flooding out the neighborhoods. You started having issues, uh, again, with uh, especially things that were dumped upstream. <laughs> because what would happen is it would flow down here into this area, 
uh, which was bad enough, but when the water went out at low tide, anything solid dumped upstream would just sit there in the sun. Mm -hmm. So, in Olmsted's mind, when he was called to Boston in the late 1870s, his first mission was not to design a park, but to design what he would call a sanitary improvement. And just to show you what, this is the area here, so if you can see, this is uh, Calm Ave coming out here. So uh, uh, the Charles River is out here. This whole design is basically a flood control mechanism. There are gatehouses that open and close that allow water to be either directed into this area temporarily while the Charles River is at high tide, or to be allowed to flow just naturally into the Charles River. In fact, you may know these two roads. Anybody know the names of the two roads that are right before you get to Kenmore Square? One's west, one's east. Charles, Charles, Charles Gate. Charles Gate, Charles Gate. Yeah, Charles Gate East and Charles Gate West, because there was a gatehouse there, that right there, that would again regulate the water. So the point is, it's a very practical design. It's not a park, it's a sewage project, and his son called it that. Back then, they didn't think of sewage projects as being something nasty. They were very proud of it, because in, in, in this country, at least, the first half of the 19th century was trying to get water into the city, and the second half was trying to get the stuff back out again, and only it wasn't water. Mm. So this is actually them dredging uh, these mm -hmm. huge storage basins in that 100 acres, uh, again, to create a very natural place. And Olmsted realized that he wasn't, there's no made land in this design. This is all marsh. That's what a fen is. A fen is usually a place where salt and fresh water come together, like uh, mm -hmm. at the mouth of the uh, like North River down in uh, where my neck of the woods are. I guess up here would be like where Plum Island, whatever the river is that comes mm -hmm. out there. Um, these are a couple of the bridges, which of course, if you have no land, to block on, you've got to have bridges because you can't have people having to go around this whole project. On the left is actually a bridge designed by his one of his best buddies, and actually a neighbor of his in Brookline. His uh, name was Henry Hobson Richardson. And some of you may have heard that name before. He designed the Trinity Church, but was probably one of the most famous landscape ar uh, uh, building architects of the 19th century. On the right is his son, John Charles's design. <laughs> Of the bridge on the left, he said, it would have suited the circumstances much better if it had not been so nice. <laughs> the one on the right, he said, it looked like the partially standing ruin work of an unskilled mason. <laughs> he was paying it a compliment. Because in his mind, what, what kind of bridge are you going to find out in the English countryside, out in that rural, rustic environment? You're going to find that Agassiz Bridge, where some farmer had to select rocks and put them in a pile and make a bridge, as opposed to the other one, which is obviously, you know, shows effort. And he didn't hate the bridge, but I mean, I'm just saying that's he, and in fact, what he did is this little shelves here that he, they designed into it so you could plant it, and then these things would just drape down into it. So it looks, again, it looks crazy and wild, but that's what he was looking for. He said, less wildness I object to. Here's another part of that same project. This is a muddy river. Uh, this, so on the right is Brookline, on the left is Boston. Same problems, in some ways the same solution, working with engineers, in this case straightening out the river so that it flows better, will be able to handle more water through it, regrading, uh, building roads so people can access it. But this is it in 1892, and this is the exact same shot in 1920. So you can kind of see how different. And in this case, uh, this project, because it was so new, in that first quote, it shows you talked about the Mighty River being novel, a new design, type of design, uh, because they didn't know what was going to survive, they really overplanted tremendously. And, and that's actually related to the English garden maxim that says, plant thick, then quick. The idea was, in Olmsted's mind, I planted out way too much than I would need. If everything survives, I cut back until it's fine. And if only half survives, I'm still not doing so bad. Mm -hmm. So uh, like a quarter of a million plantings in, in uh, a, a, a space, of, I want to say like about an acre and a half or something like that. Now, the opposite of that design, in some ways, was Jamaica Pond. So the Muddy River is flowing this way, to the right. So if you go upstream, eventually you'll come to Jamaica Pond. Uh, and one of the biggest questions that we ask, is Jamaica Pond a real pond, or did Olmsted make it? It's a real pond. It's a, a kettle hole that's a glacially formed, very deep, clear, uh, natural water source, actually the water source for the city of Boston. And in Olmsted's mind, sometimes a landscape architect's job was not so much to create scenery, but to create access to scenery without destroying it. <laughs> so a lot of it was uh, a road around the periphery. Uh, this had all been private estates, so it was already kind of developed as nice land. In other words, it didn't have to do a whole lot. Uh, open up views, which was very important in Olmsted's mind, that you get to see the river, I mean, see the uh, pond. And I, I always think of the, the, the sculptor who was once asked, how did you sculpt that beautiful dog? 
and the sculptor said it was really easy. I took a piece of stone and I cut away everything that didn't look like a dog. <laughs> <laughs> so in some ways, when he was designing parks, that would be it. Incongruous elements, as he put it. Oh, revealing in some ways a park that exists beneath what's on there. Uh, but again, a very light touch. And he preferred this. But unfortunately, when cities were setting aside land for parks, they usually found land that was cheap. And it was usually cheap for a good reason, like a swamp. Mm -hmm. It's done a lot of parks and a lot of nasty places. Central Park is a great example of that. You couldn't have found 840 acres of worst landscape in Manhattan. Um, traveling through the system was extremely important. And it was extremely important that if you were traveling through it, you could enjoy the scenery. He didn't want you worrying about what you were worrying downtown where you get hit by a carriage or whatever. So if you've ever wondered, if you know this area of the Arbor Way between Jamaica Pond and the Arboretum, you may wonder, why are there three roads? Well, in Olmsted's mind, these side roads were purely for commercial travel. People going to their houses or making deliveries. The road up the middle was purely for pleasure traffic, people in carriages, just to enjoy scenery. So they didn't have to worry about running into the whatever truck going to make a delivery at the house. You had a promenade for people walking, and you had a bridal path for people on horseback. And the idea was, again, you could go through the landscape unconsciously, and when you met an other type of road at grade, you would either go around it, or there would be a, some sort of an underpass or overpass. In fact, uh, a lot of people think one of the reasons why they won the design competition for Central Park was their solution for getting four roads across it without destroying the experience. And he did that by uh, doing something on a version of what was called haha. English estates, what they would do is they would put, they would have a large open meadow that they wanted to keep sheep in, but they didn't want to look at a fence. So what they would do is they would dig down low enough that they could put the fence at the, kind of at the bottom of a V. So, so if you picture looking up over the field, that fence is below your sight line, and all you see is meadow. And he did that with the transverse roads that crossed the park. You wouldn't even know they were there because they're below the level of the park. But anyways, here's another example of that idea of separation of allowing people to experience the parks in a relaxing way. And of course, the next stop would be the Arnold Arboretum. I'm going to take a guess when I said, who here has been to the Emerald Necklace? A lot of you folks have been here. It's probably the, it's certainly the best maintained because how it got into the park system was the land was harvested. It was actually willed to them by a guy named Benjamin Bussey, who used to farm the land. And actually, Bussey was just like Olmsted, a scientific farmer. He had a, a telescope on top of Bussey Hill. Um, but anyways, when he dies, he leaves it to Harvard University with the stipulation that it be used for some type of educational purpose. They sit on it for years. They don't really have any money to do anything with it. Yes, Harvard University at that point had no money. Uh, what happens is in uh, 1868, a new Bedford businessman named James Arnold passes away. He's also into horticulture. He, his trustees are given the order to find some type of an organization or some type of an institution that they could put that money towards. So more or less, they have the money but no land. Harvard has the land but no money, and in 1872 they get together and establish the first arboretum, really large-scale arboretum in the country. Ten years later, Olmsted and the first director, Charles Sargent, come up with the idea of giving this land to the city of Boston as the Emerald Necklace is starting to form, partially because they didn't want to have it taken by eminent domain, but under the stipulation that Elisa signed. And so Harvard University actually rents this land from the city for a dollar a year. Uh, the city maintains police patrols and things like that, and what provides water, but uh, the, the rest of it is all maintained, uh, the trees and the collections are all maintained by Harvard University. So that's why it's so much better maintained than most other parts of the Emerald Necklace. And there's Lilac Sunday on the right there. Actually, 1909, they were already having Lilac Sunday. Anybody ever been to Lilac Sunday? Yeah. People say, when should I visit the Arboretum for the first time? And I said, any day but the second Sunday of May. <laughs> yes, I think that is a picture of Lilac Sunday there. And the last part of the Emerald Necklace is uh, really our central park, our park that in Olmsted's mind could fulfill that idea of complete escape from the town, as he would say, mm -hmm. Franklin Park. Uh, this is Forest Hill's entrance, so the Forest Hill Cemetery, if you're familiar with this area, would be here. This is Morton Street, Blue Hill Ave, the zoo is all in this area here. About 500 acres, so smaller than Central Park, but the Emerald Necklace is 1,200, so we beat them there. Mm -hmm. And again, just like Central Park, the idea of creating this very relaxing, pastoral, the idea of space was so important. He so said, that's the beauty I'm looking for, the beauty of the prairie, of the rolling meadow. Uh, and that, you know, if I told you this was in, uh, some sort of a picture of a place out in the countryside, there's really no reason why you would believe me. There's nothing there that says that this is in the middle of the city, which it is. It's actually geographically almost exactly in the middle of the city. 
And just like Central Park, I talked about the idea of sequencing scenery. You have the same thing at Franklin Park. Here's Ellicott Dale Arch. Um, again, so that you, the architecture is as subservient to nature as possible. This is all made out of Roxbury pudding stone, which is the conglomerate that you find everywhere around the Boston area. So in Olmsted's mind, that, as he said, the less things seem dressed up by human hands, the better. And one of the ways you did that was by building things with things you find around anyways, mm -hmm. as opposed to like something granite, which you know automatically somebody, I mean, you know somebody built it, but it just seems a little bit more in keeping. Mm -hmm. And again, as you travel through that tunnel, eventually as you come out on the other side, you have that large space. Mm -hmm. Sheep, yes, they did have sheep, but almost all of them said parks, Central Park by Adam's like 1934. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea again was, in Olmsted's mind, they're, they're visually interesting to look at, they cut the grass, but they don't cut the grass in a very uh, artificial way. Otherwise, it's not like a golf course, which this is now. Um, and it has been since actually the park was built almost, because they were already saying, ah, fairway, no, not metal. Um, and uh, so this is, again, that idea of relaxation, the sound of the sheep, again, very English. And there's that picture of Blenheim again. And you can kind of see the, boomet, the similarity between that and this picture of Scarborough Pond in Franklin Park. And actually, that pond is a kind of a funny story. It's actually the case study our third graders used. There was no pond in the original design. And when the school children saw it, they got really upset and went to the mayor of Boston and demanded a, a pond in Franklin <laughs> Park. So I guess, you know, I'm sure the mayor kid, that's about the kids, but the parents voted. So he <laughs> went to Olmsted and uh, working with an engineer, he got a conduit from Jamaica Pond to help feed a, a <laughs> pond in Franklin Park. But again, very relaxing. He could do things like use dark material in the foreground plant material and lighter plant material in the background to create what's oftentimes called atmospheric perspective. If you're familiar with Mona Lisa, he's always used some mm -hmm. sample of that. Uh, but again, that idea of you're in the middle of the countryside and of course also it's a gathering place. Though with Franklin Park, he really designed Franklin Field to be the place where you'd have these large gatherings like this in Caribbean Day. But it was still the idea of the community using it. Now, I don't know if any of you remember back when they were proposing the Olympics, they were talking a little bit about Columbia Road. They were doing that because the original design for Olmsted was not to have a park system in here, but rather to travel along a parkway, just like the Arbor Way, all the way down what's now Columbia Road, all the way out to the very tip of South Boston. Anybody tell me what's at the very tip of South Boston there? If you go. Castle Island? Yeah, exactly. Castle, Castle, Castle Island. Island. Yeah, Castle, Island. Island. Yeah, Castle yeah. Island. That was. This was uh, what he also called Marine Park. Most they called it Pleasure Bay. Uh, but this was going to be the termination point. So you would actually be able to travel from the marshes of the Fens up that freshwater stream of the Muddy River to that pond out of the Arboretum to the rurality of Franklin Park. And then if you're really ambitious, you can go all the way out. And the funny thing is, though, man, when you're dressed like this, you probably want to go by the ocean. <laughs> uh, so it was actually one of the most popular parts of the park when it was, you know, uh, it still is part of the Emerald Necklace, technically. It's just that that connection isn't there if you go to on Columbia Road. So here's people's promenading, which was basically what you know, cruising was to the 1950s, promenading was to the 1890s. And, but it was that way of people interacting. It was so important in people's, that people interact with each other and that people of all walks of life would interact. Uh, his sons continued on the work uh, of Olmsted. Olmsted retires kind of in the middle of the Emerald Necklace. Uh, his son's work on the Emerald Necklace, probably the most significant non-Olmstead, though, is Charles Eliot. And, and arguably, Charles Eliot is more significant to Massachusetts than this is heresy, I'm sure. I don't anybody say I said it. Actually, it's being taped, isn't it? Charles <laughs> Eliot is more important to Massachusetts than Frederick Law Olmstead is, in terms of design. Mainly because uh, Charles Eliot helped set up our metropolitan park system. And he also worked on a lot of the Emerald Necklace. But again, Massachusetts, about 1,200 projects, again, 150 cities and towns. Uh, this is by you guys. This is, the, is that the crane site? Yeah, the crane site. Which was a multiple designers. In fact, one of his protégés, Arthur Scherflip, did work up there too. Uh, this is actually close by too. I didn't realize. Uh, if you're familiar with Moraine Farm in Beverly, yeah, that was an Olmsted design, the Phillips Estate. And actually, I used to know the woman who owned that with her husband, George. Uh, this is Elm Bank, where the Mass Fort Society is in Natick and Wellesley. I think it borders both. And this is down the Cape. Anybody? Kennedy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They, work for, they work for the Kennedys. In fact, we have photographs of the Kennedys' uh, estate before it was the Kennedys' estate. They were doing work for the Kennedys. Mrs. Rose Kennedy, or Joseph Kennedy, actually, is in the book, just doing the surveying. 
before they bought the property. The, the castle estate that they just finished updating. Yeah, that's I what they, I heard. I think they spent like thirteen million. The yeah, trust the reservation. Yeah, and, and actually it brought it back to where, kind of, well, they needed rehabbing. Yeah, that's what I heard. Yeah, they did, I think it was thirteen million dollars. Well, that's and they did another one that might have been an homestead that they owned up in Western Mass. I forget the name. Of it that. wouldn't surprise me because they did so many private estates. Yeah, uh, there's Charles Elliott again, and it's again just showing you how much. This is the emerald necklace here. You can really think of that's supposed to be Franklin Park, I and mean, here, yeah. But you can see how much he added by this kind of an outer necklace. So uh, Elliott's thought was all this land was being gobbled up. We have one shot. At setting aside 9,000 acres to be the Blue Hills, and we better mm -hmm. take it. And he and other people uh, pushed for this metropolitan park system. So, I mean, just in terms of sheer acreage, he has affected. But the trustees' reservation was also with his brainchild. Uh, with, uh, he was the one who came with the idea of a private land trust, and that was actually the basis for the British trust. So, we came first before the British. That, that's actually the oldest, the TKR is the oldest trust in the United States. Yeah. And this is some of the places, uh, Nad Casket Beach uh, up in the left in Middlesex Fells. Mm -hmm. uh, Dixie's long gone. This is my dog Dixie. I've never not. Uh, oh. oh, yeah. The, uh, let's see. She is in eighth grade. <laughs> These are my, some of my co workers. We went on a hike in the Blue Hills in uh, just a park, right? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Now, this is the big prize. I mean, I, I think you folks are familiar with the Phillips Academy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the most worked on projects by the Olmstead firm. About 1,300 plants they produced for this one project. So was, when I was trying to get some things together just to show you tonight, it was like too much stuff to look at. And why there's all these multiple plans and they're very hard to see is because the first plan they do is 1891, then they come back in 1910, and this one I think is in between like 94 and then 30 something. They were involved with this project for years and years and years and years. And these are actually some uh, photographs they took. This is them building some type of pond. And you folks, if anybody's familiar with Phillips Academy, probably know more than I about this. I think what they call it. Um, and this is a model they actually made. They, the firm had a model making shop where I work, and they would actually build models of landscapes for clients. And this is a modern picture. I don't think it's the same building, but I just wanted to give a close up of what the type of models that they would make. But. Uh, these are really kind of cool because they're doing a before and after, spring 29, spring 30. So you can see these are just, you know, before, after, before, after, before, after. Mm -hmm. uh, so they did a lot, a lot of work at Phillips County. They did a lot of work everywhere. But, uh, okay, so this is this is my wrap-up image. Uh, this is back to Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. And this is him actually uh, standing in the midst of what would really be his last hurrah, which was Biltmore Estate down in Asheville, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And if you've been there, you may even recognize this portrait by John Singer Sargent. Uh, it's down there along with Richard Morris Hunt on the other side of the fireplace. Uh, because Hunt was the architect. Uh, it's an interesting uh, story behind the portrait. <coughs> because Olmsted was getting very ill at this point in time and couldn't stand for long periods of time, uh, when Sargent painted this, the, the head is that of Frederick Law Olmsted, but his son put on Olmsted's clothes and stood in for the body. So you got Olmsted Senior on the top and Olmsted Junior on the bottom. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, you know, again, I don't want to be too cute about it, but in some ways the father it has his ideas carried to the next century by his son. And he very specifically named him Frederick Law Olmsted for a reason. It wasn't coincidence. In fact, he did, just this kind of funny side note, Frederick Olmsted Junior's son didn't have his name until he was six years old. First they called him Boy for a while, <laughs> then they called him Henry for a while, and then finally when he was six they changed his name to Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. Um, it's a, a beautiful portrait, um, but it's it's always like, I mentioned before that idea of altruism, that Olmsted really in some ways, a uh, landscape architect, is an ultimate altruist because he designs things that things have to grow. And the irony is that when Olmsted visited England, remember he took that trip and saw the English estates and he wrote his book? He wrote in his book, What Art is So Noble, as he, with far-reaching conception of beauty and designing power, sketches the outlines, writes the colors, and directs the shadow of a picture so great that nature should be employed upon it for generations before the work he has arranged for her shall realize his intentions. Mm -hmm. Or somebody once said, the true meaning of life is to plant a tree under which you shade in your aspect to sit. <laughs> so anyways, uh, I thank you all for having me up here tonight, and I'll show you take any questions. <laughs> Don't be shy. Don't be shy.
Any questions? Sorry. Hey, you have okay. oh, you got I was yeah. curious about Central Park and, and what he had connections clearly, but what were they looking for in a design that this really hadn't been done previously? Well, I think they were just looking for a design that was cohesive. There were parameters that had to be put into the park. For example, there had to be four roads that traversed the park. Uh, and it was <coughs> said because the solution they came up with by sinking the roads below eye level that it didn't intrude, that was one of the reasons they got it. It was just a, ju it was a, really in some ways subjective. It was, a, it was a landscape design that was chosen because it had all the right things and it, they thought it would look good as opposed to the one that the engineer had designed, which was purely just like very formal gardens and things like that. And the biggest one, as far as I know, and it's actually a matter of thinking, they didn't know who submitted what. I'm not sure if it was a blind contest. <laughs> if it wasn't, they probably, in fact, I think it was not a blind contest. I think they did know, and that now makes more sense to me. I'm sorry if I'm talking, and, yeah, and so, because Calvin Vox actually was the partner of a guy named Andrew Jackson Downing. And Downing was the one who actually really got that land set aside for a park. Unfortunately, and he was a very well-known landscape gardener. Uh, he lived in Newburgh, New York, and he was like a he was like a, a almost I don't want to say Martha Stewart because that's kind of but he was a, a the, 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 the taste master. You know, if, if Downing said this is the way you should design your grounds, this is the way you should design your grounds. Unfortunately, he was in a he was in a steamboat accident on the Hudson. Actually, he was trying to save his mother-in-law and he drowned. So Box was without a partner. If down and didn't drown, I would not be sitting here today. I completely believe that down and didn't I think maybe because Vox was involved with that. But most people, even designers today, say no, it was just a better design. They just did more with what they had uh, than the other ones. Is the restoration of the Emblem Neck, is that complete yet? Or when will it be? Oh, uh, well, I, I'm not, I'm not going to be sn snidey about it. They'll never really be complete, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, the they are putting things, but yeah. Yeah, that's, well. Like, fan, um, the parking lot. And yeah, all that stuff the there. Room. What she's talking about is if you go down to where the, mm -hmm. I still call it Sears building, I'm sorry. Oh. The landmark. Center I know, yeah. Sears yeah. Building. <laughs> so uh, what happened was Sears Roebuck was there. Uh, they, they blackmailed the city that if they didn't yeah. want to build a parking lot on top of that piece yeah. of parkland, they would leave. Yeah. There was a park lot there for years and years and years. Of course, Sears is long gone. Yeah. Eventually the land got back to the city. In 96, mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember, the huge flooding that occurred. Uh, Henmore Station got flooded up yeah. like 15 mm -hmm. feet, all the mm -hmm. colleges. And anyways, that got the Army Corps of Engineers involved. So what they're doing down there is they're daylighting. They're, they're getting rid of the land on top of what had been an open water course <laughs> to make it an open water course again, yeah. help more water get through there, and restore the plantings as Olmstead had designed them initially. Right. Now, well, the parking lot is going to then by Emmanuel and Simmons and yep. all they did. Yeah. The whole yeah. thing, yeah. yeah. They're going from basically yeah. Avenue Louis de Pasteur yep. 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 all the way up to really the Muddy River yep. right at the yep. landmark yep. center. And they also did work down towards Charles River. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah that's so a someday. Big part of it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it's just it's an incredible amount of work. But it's improvement no matter what. I mean. The parks are a lot better now than they were when I yeah. started working yeah. for yeah. Elmstead site. Mm -hmm. They are definitely in better yeah. shape now. They still, you know, some parks though, still need a lot of work. But yeah. it's money and it's what you consider to be valuable. Any other questions? Was that Phillips Andover you were showing? Yes, Phillips Andover. Yep. So that's on the register? Oh, I'm sure, oh, I'm sure it's on the yeah, National Register. Yeah, it's on a national <laughs> park, but it's on the National Register. Everything's on the National Register. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't take that much. And in fact, the people always get worried when they get on the National Register. It's like, it, because, you know, some people want to have the right to do whatever they want with their property. They don't want it for the National Register. The local <laughs> laws are the ones that if you were really going to get the hand tied in terms of changing things, those are the ones that are more likely to cause you some but again, thank you all. Oh, thank you. Perfect timing. We actually have a call for our alarm. So. <laughs>